Hello, this is Kira Knightley. As part of the Métier d'Art show experience at the Château des Dames, the Château de Chenonceau in the Loire Valley in France, I will be reading an extract on the history of the castle, also known as Ladies' Castle, and its prominent female figures from the text, from one Renaissance to the other, written by Fanny Arama. Chenonceau. Three singing syllables to designate a castle mirage floating across the surface of the river Cher, over which its silhouette reaches and is reflected. This silhouette does not stand out on the bank. Instead, it continues, most naturally, in the same way as a perfectly cut dress would follow the undulating line of a female body thus exalted and carried forth by expert hands, a symbol of permanence and domination, In the folds of the valley it interrupts, with its verticality. The castle is a mark of distinction, of taking possession. It signals the presence of strong souls and of tormented destinies, which its façade both glorifies and conceals at the same time. Embellished in turn by women of great character, Catherine Brissonnet, Diane de Poitiers, Catherine de Medici, Louise de Lorraine, and Madame Dupin. The current architecture of Chanonceau, also known as the Château des Dames, is predominantly the work of Catherine de Medici, who enhanced it tirelessly for 30 years. Imagine her striding down garden paths or through the corridors of the chateau, meticulous and vigilant, like a designer among her seamstresses, reviewing the construction of gallery balconies or the piercing of lateral walls, modifying friezes for dormer windows arranging ceiling coffers. She also employed numerous artists whose duty it was to make even the briefest promenade with her ladies in the gardens and the park, nothing short of delectable. We know, thanks to an article written by Gabrielle Chanel in the magazine Revue des Sports et du Monde in 1936, that she had always been struck by a strange feeling of sympathy and admiration towards the women who lived from Francois I to Louis XIII, perhaps because she found them all to be great, with a magnificent simplicity and a majesty imbued with onerous duties. But what strength, what character, what willingness to be present and to take precedence in the outfits of 16th century ladies, she exclaimed. For the prestige of rank, they had to appear. They appeared as queens in front of the tournament of life. Their magnificent clothes were the coat of arms of the house and its social status, armed with brocade, lampas and lace, upright and smiling, more women than nude goddesses. It was their intelligence and their seduction that, on a pedestal of riches, set the tempo. I love that Catherine de' Medici pushed the concern to reign as a woman with a woman's weapons. Catherine de' Medici and Gabrielle Chanel were both tireless builders. Nothing could hinder the accomplishment of their visions. Remarkable similarities punctuate the existence of the two women. Orphaned at a young age, they wore the same monogram, a double C, that suggests infinite meditations on the meaning of these two curved, inverted, almost closed, fatally intertwined letters. This double C reflects the attraction held by Renaissance women and Gabrielle Chanel, for the chain. The precise place of the chain's birth is fascinating, that of a tangled succession of rings which fit into each other and whose symmetry is perfect. The chain becomes the very symbol of consistency and the pattern signalled by just one of its links is infinitely open. Paradoxically, this interdependence of the rings, never welded nor entirely closed, suggests eternal renewal. Catherine de' Medici and Gabrielle Chanel were also both confronted with the violent death of their loved ones. The same foreboding, the same anxiety, the same despondency. Two men in the prime of their lives, and yet Catherine watched helplessly as Henry II was mortally wounded with a spear in his hand during a tournament on the Rue Saint-Antoine in Paris. For his part, Boy Cabell had been killed in a car crash on a notoriously dangerous road in the south of France. After his death, Gabrielle Chanel 
surrounded herself with symbols that immutably reminded her of Boy's interests and taste for cosmic forces, reincarnation, esotericism, and the occult sciences. Disciplines signalling a state of mind also favoured by the Renaissance, before being censured by 17th century classical rationalism that stiffened morals and taught men to dream with restraint. While the same poetic spirit animated Gabrielle Chanel and the traditions of Renaissance princes, it can also be seen in their shared taste for the motto and for the emblem. Gabrielle Chanel adopted the lion, a symbol of the strength she had lacked when, bereaved, she travelled through Venice. It is the city's emblem, and of the cunning that every being needs to survive the blows of fate. We find it imposing, engraved on the mantelpiece and in the tapestries of Catherine and Thomas Beaurier at Chanonceau, statuesque, wise and mineral, on either side of the driveway leading up to the castle. Portraits of Renaissance women were an essential part of their increasing power at court, and these representations confirm this. Only the king could authorise and supervise the production of these works, showing their circulation had political purpose. If reigning is akin to appearing, the ladies of Chanonceau reigned a great deal more than their lovers, husbands and the sovereigns of the time. When contemplating the drawings and engravings of Diane de Poitiers, Catherine de Medici, Gabrielle, Testré or Louise de Lorraine, one is at first held back by the grace and steadfastness of their stately demeanour, immediately attributed to their attire but closer examination confirms that the effect produced is in no way due to their ceremonial dress. Just as a simple tie would enhance the natural freshness and beauty of a bouquet of purple dahlias, the brocade dresses from which their resolute faces emerge simply serve as a sheath for the magnetic gaze of these women, reflecting the conduct they demanded of themselves. In these portraits, they appear as unperturbable as the plot of history itself, as inexorable as the burden of their sacred duties. This explains why the viewer might feel unsettled when he admires a queen or her castle. It is thought, in these places, and in these official portraits, that there are very few works in which the self takes up more space, and yet so little at the same time. What do we really know about these women? About their lives, their concerns, their desires, their accomplishments? If these women deserve our admiration and our respect, it is because they were aware of their right to intervene in the fields in which they triumphed. The court and the arts for the ladies of Chenonceau and the world of fashion for Gabrielle Chanel. The energy they devoted to their quest for the ideal and in particular to the moral and aesthetic improvement of women now benefits the entire world. They knew how to invent the present with grace without ever mimicking the customs that were obsolete.